Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Peter Gubin. This is Anton Sirochev. And uh, today, I would like to talk with you about uh, Blender in game development. But first, let me um, sh uh, tell you a little bit about us. We work at Trey Studio, where we create uh, game content for well-known titles. Uh, and then as an expert in 3D and 2D, we collaborate with studios like uh, Infinity Ward, uh, for, uh, for Games, uh, War Gaming, and uh, Gajin Entertainment to create awesome games. So I'd like to show you some artwork did by our artists at Trace. Uh, we create uh, environment art, character art, uh, as well as uh, vehicles, weapons, and other hard surface stuff. So. But today we would like to uh, talk mainly about environment art. We won't be talking about animation, rigging, stuff like that. So, as you can see here, a lot of we make a lot of environment art. And today we, would like, we will be talking about uh, current state for Blender with the arrival of uh, 2.8. And uh, Anton will be talking about intro to environment art. I will show you um, tips and tricks that will hopefully help you uh, with your own game ready art creation. Mm. Also, we'll be talking about uh, how we use Blender and why we use it in our pipelines. And uh, finally, we will be talking about how c Blender could be improved to make it even better in the future. So, Let's, uh, <laughs> let me, uh, Anton will be talking about Curacetto Blender in game dev. Hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So you have already seen the slide after that. Uh, this is how I felt about the uh, arrival of Blender 2.8. So, <clears throat> when Blender 2.8 arrived uh, in experimental branch, I was uh, beginning to learn Blender with the intention of switching over to it completely. At that time, I was uh, using other uh, industry standard software, uh, both at home and at work. Uh, but I was really missing some software that would allow me to uh, model with the same speed that Blender offers. <laughs> so, what I really liked about Blender was its uh, clean UI, uh, and powerful modifiers. Uh, so uh, those two things alone were already a big improvement over what I had to deal with on a daily basis. But what really sold me onto Blender uh, was uh, the new real-time rendering engine called Eevee. And this is uh, 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 work by uh, Daniel Beistadt, if I remember it correctly. So uh, what Eevee allowed me to do was to preview my vertex normals, my surfaces, how they look in the viewport, uh, how my textures look, how uh, my material layers work, uh, without actually uh, you know, exporting the asset into your game engine. So in that sense, Blender gives you freedom, uh, because it removes that extra step, and uh, you, know, uh, you save time by doing that. Uh, so, let me talk about a little bit about uh, Blender game development now. Uh, so, uh, Blender is being used on uh, big game projects right now, but I have to say that uh, in terms of becoming a part of pipeline, outside of simply modeling stuff, uh, there are still some challenges. So, um, mm, in-house tools uh, remain uh, oriented to industry standard software, and uh, uh, it is used for uh, organizing um, scenes and also for animation and rigging, and that's all good. Uh, but uh, there are also uh, such uh, uh, third-party plugins like Havoc, uh, which are not supporting Blender at the moment. And I think with how Blender 2.8 is progressing, uh, this is going to change in the future. Uh, so at the same time, I have to say that uh, people new to Blender uh, have, do not have to fear that they will not be able to use Blender uh, uh, at their workplace because uh, uh, Blender fits any modeling pipeline. Uh, so, uh, why do we use? Why our company use, uh, uses 
uh, Blender in uh, AAA uh, projects. Uh, because Blender is efficient, because it supports our modeling workflows, and from Boolean to Bevel modifiers, it allows to do our job in a very fast, very efficient, non-destructive, and uh, a very procedural way. And we very much like that. So uh, a, a little bit into, uh, uh, I'll talk about an introduction uh, to creation of environment assets for uh, video games and uh, you know, real-time applications like that. Uh, so, the current generation video game consoles uh, have uh, uh, a very, I, I should say, a, a fairly limited amount of texture memory, but at the same time, they can handle a lot of polygons on the screen at the, uh, at the same time. So, uh, for you as an artist, this means that you have to get very creative with how you handle your UV mapping and uh, texturing. And this is how uh, getting creative with UV mapping actually feels like. Uh, what kind of texture uh, size you should uh, uh, use? What kind of uh, type of texture you should use? This is mainly decided by the size of your asset and also its importance and proximity to the player's point of view. Uh, so in this graph, you'll see that small assets are uniquely textured, uh, medium assets are textured using trims and decals, while big assets use uh, uh, tileable textures and uh, material layering. In reality, of course, this is not so clear-cut, and uh, most of these uh, techniques are used together in conjunction also with uh, such supporting techniques as uh, custom vertex normals, uh, vertex color painting, um, material layering, and stuff like that. There are many, uh, uh, many, many techniques with which you can uh, achieve a visually rich look for your real-time assets. So, unique texturing. Unique texturing is easy, uh, very easy to implement, very easy to understand for newcomers, but at the same time, it, allow, at the same time, it allows for a lot of visual richness. Uh, but due to its unique nature and the fact that uh, system, uh, the current generation systems have limited uh, texture memory, uh, they become pretty um, expensive. They can become pretty expensive. So how do you mitigate uh, some of uh, this issue? How do you offset the cost of uh, unique textures? You can uh, overlap or mirror some of its elements, uh, but that's about it uh, in uh, how to fix that issue. Uh, so next up, you need to make something, uh, something medium-sized, like, uh, let's say, a fireplace. Uh, for this one, uh, you will need to use streams. Also a unique texture, yeah. So very unique, very rich. Uh, but for medium-sized asset, you need to use streams. Uh, because uh, you cannot use uh, unique uh, texturing on uh, small assets. That would be very expensive. So trims are basically, sorry, uh, trims are basically textures uh, that are tileable only in one direction, horizontal or vertical. And you can move these trims around just like that. Sorry. Yeah, just like that uh, to give your asset a more interesting and exciting look. Um, at the same time, you would do, uh, it would be beneficial for you if you could include other uh, elements into your trim texture, into the same uh, texture space, I should say, uh, like unique elements, uniquely baked, unique, uniquely textured, and also elements uh, like decals that you can mix using a second UV channel. Uh, so as you can see, I am mapping uh, uh, decals into the uh, other material, into the material. And with that, uh, with that, I can uh, achieve visual richness. So, okay, uh, third type of texture, tileable textures. Um, uh, for instance, you need to make a big uh, asset, like a building. Uh, for this one, you cannot use unique texture, and you cannot use streams. Well, you could, but that would be more trouble than it's worth. Uh, and uh, since you are using uh, uh, tileable textures and you have to uh, build something huge, you need to probably use several of those tileable materials. And you can, sorry, uh, and you can, uh, uh, you can mix these materials together using such techniques as uh, uh, bitmap, bitmap masks or uh, as it is shown in the next screen, uh, vertex color painting. So, uh, as you can see, we mix uh, the materials with uh, red, green, blue, and other colors. 
And you can also uh, take uh, colors in between uh, for smoother transitions. So this GIF is made by Peter. He's very good at this technique. Uh, he, he's very clever. He also uh, mixed in uh, uh, masks uh, for uh, height maps so that you know, the grout and, uh, uh, is shown uh, below the actual paint. Uh, so yeah, some more vertex color painting. And uh, uh, yet more vertex color painting. I hope you're not bored with that. OK. So why do I talk, uh, speak so much about uh, all of this texturing and uh, UV mapping stuff? Simply because I want to stress how important UV mapping is. And uh, naturally, the tools that uh, uh, allow you to do that have to be very robust. Uh, I have to say that uh, uh, tools for UV mapping in Blender uh, are lacking at the moment. And uh, objectively speaking, other industries, industry so, uh, standard software does this job so much better. So um, how do we progress from here? How do we improve Blender? I think the best way would be to uh, get inspired by example of other uh, industry standard software. And it has a lot of neat features. They, uh, several software packages. Uh, first of all, uh, signing and checking uh, check texel density uh, by clicking a button. So this one is really important because uh, you do not want your text density values across all of your assets to be random. You need to uh, get them more or less uniform. And uh, uh, this would lead to a smoother uh, player experience. Otherwise, uh, some of your assets will have a very pixelated, very blurry look, and some others uh, yet will have a very crisp and very texture-rich look. <laughs> So uh, another uh, second thing that I want to point out, uh, what would be good to have in Blender, is uh, straightening UV shells. Uh, so uh, basically, you would uh, uh, use that a lot in environment assets uh, for uh, uh, games, because you will work a lot with uh, trim textures, and you will need to, uh, to have a, a very easy way to map your um, uh, UV shells into, onto trim elements. And uh, a third thing uh, I think would be good to have is uh, uh, an unfolding algorithm. So others, other industry standard software has good uh, unfolding algorith algorithms, and they allow you uh, basically to remove stretching in your UV mapping. Blender has something like that, I, I know, but it doesn't work as well. And I think this algorithm has to improve. And I know what you, you, you will say, that uh, all of this stuff can be mitigated by using uh, third-party plugins, uh, paid plugins, free plugins. But we really want uh, Blender to be an ultimate 3D package. And we want, it to, uh, we want my vanilla, Blender, vanilla Blender to uh, work out of the box the best way it could possibly do. And now, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm done with that. Now Peter is going to tell you more about modeling tips and tricks that we use at our work on a daily basis. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to show you some tips and tricks. And they are, I would like to point out that they are using core blending functionality, so they don't require any uh, third party uh, add ons and stuff like that. First one is uh, when I use in decimation, I often use a bunch of uh, vertex groups uh, to mask the uh, several decimation modifiers. And it's a great way to control different areas of decimation and uh, it's procedural, so you have control over the result. So um, as you can see here, I remove a lot of geometry from the edges by uh, painting and then removing the unnecessary geometry there. Uh, next one is a uh, technique I use for organic modeling, uh, and it's uh, uh, several um, modifiers such as solidify and subsurface, and it's a great way to uh, model organic shapes. I try to work with simplest geometry as possible when I model stuff like this, and it allows me to uh, m make this stuff in a quick way. And you can use booleans with that, and, and uh, yeah, it's it's really powerful. So um, now I would like to uh, talk a little bit about new um, modifier features in 2.8. Uh, 
The first one is uh, UV, uh, UV offset. It's important because uh, when you use uh, array and you get the overlapping UVs, you get this, the um, baking errors. And it's a great way to avoid that b because uh, you don't need to collapse modifier and move your uh, UVs outside of zero to one space. So you just, the way it works is that you offset it by a margin of one and you're good to go. Uh, mirror UV offset is the same feature for mirror and again, it's a great way to get cleaner bakes uh, when working with uh, mirror geometry. Uh, data transfer modifier is really useful uh, in specific cases and it's rarely in, in a spotlight, but it can be really uh, helpful and most, uh, most uh, useful data to transfer is custom versus normal, CVs and various color. Mm, and here, you can, as you can see, I have issues due to uh, the fact that I cut the cylinder in non-uniform and messy way, uh, and resulting in uh, bad topology. And this happens a lot when you cut your geometry for second V channel or stuff like that. And you can easily fix that by, transfer, by transferring normals from, uh, in this example, clean cylinder, and you get correct shading. A triangulate modifier uh, is great in 2.8 because it um, allows you now to triangulate only n-gons, uh, which is great, and which is, uh, it's even better because it preserves normals now. Uh, why is preservation so important? Well, because you want to, you want to uh, have your geometry sh shaded correctly when you triangulate it, because if you rely on FBX exporter or stuff like that, basically standard exporters, you don't have a control over triangulation and you can get errors uh, due to different triangulations and stuff like that. So as you can see here, I have triangulate modifier on the uh, end of the stack and I get correct shading and I can be sure that I will get correct shading across different applications. Uh, next one is Boolean modifier. And it's great, it's, it's been great, but now it's even greater because um, it can work with bevel modifier, which have uh, custom works normals now. And uh, it's great because it's procedural and there is simply no other tool that do dynamic booleans uh, in such powerful and uh, efficient way. And it's uh, very flexible. And uh, stuff you may not know is that you can tra uh, transfer the data from Boolean objects, so, uh, any data su such as uh, vertex colors, UV mapping, stuff like that, which will be hand handy later, uh, as you will see. Uh, next one is custom works normals. Mm, custom works normals is a way to affect your shading, and uh, it's been used in game dev for a while now, but uh, now we have the a bunch of modifiers that do this procedurally, and we don't uh, need uh, tools like Yavna and uh, other tools. And as you can see here, we have average normals on the left and custom vertex, on, uh, vertex normals on the right. So uh, here is the first way to get custom vertex normals out of the, uh, out of the box. And uh, bevel modifier now have option to harden normals. It's basically a way to get uh, procedural custom vertex normals uh, with bevel. And second one is weighted normals modifier, which is awesome because you have, um, on top of having uh, procedural custom works normals, you have uh, an option to preserve hard edges and also you can ha uh, affect uh, custom works normal shading by hand by using weights. So here is an example of uh, using custom works normals for baking stuff. Uh, here I have a rock which uh, will have a lot of gradients on normal map where if I use it with uh, average normals, but I can use custom works normals and get flat surfaces and avoid a lot of shading on normal map. And it's a great way to uh, get cleaner bakes. And uh, yeah, uh, one thing you should note is that your baker and your game engine should support the custom works normal. Um, Here's an example of using a bunch of uh, stuff I uh, discussed before. So here's a couple of booleans and bell modifier with custom works normals. And uh, this subject is uh, procedural. It's great to, uh, to have procedural bevels, real-time bevels. Um, so here's another example. You have 
uh, a bunch of booleans, and you can see Glomer symbol here is it's mapped to each second easy channel uh, used by a source object. So it's a great way to transfer different UV map like that. Um, and here's another example how you ca could achieve uh, wall damage like that using uh, that technique. Here I use uh, one plane with solidify modifier and a bunch of UV channels. The wall damage is mapped to second V channel, and uh, I even transfer uh, vertex normal uh, vertex colors here from the boolean object. So it's a great way to get such wall damage uh, with uh, ease of editing, and you can co copy this stuff over, and uh, yeah, you will get uh, cast uh, wall damage really easily. Next one is paneling which I use for my uh, one of my personal scenes. Uh, it's uh, basically, uh, again, this um, plane, and I cut, can cut geometry easily and uh, use solidify on, on the top and bevel to achieve these uh, hard, surface, uh, hard surfaces, and this is a result. And this map doesn't use any uh, unique textures, so um, here's another technique it's a variation of previous technique, and here I basically uh, curve the panels along the curved object, and uh, I use two instances, one without a modifier, in, uh, curve modifier, and one with, and uh, it's a great way to edit stuff like this. You can uh, edit the object uh, on the plane and preview the result right, right there. So here's the result. Uh, another useful technique is to use asset linking, and it's a great way to mitigate the complexity of, of the scenes by separating objects into their, uh, it, their own scenes, and uh, it helps a lot with uh, dealing with such, uh, such uh, objects like windows or stuff like that, because uh, you have uh, simple objects on the top of the, uh, on in their separate scenes, and uh, you will propagate any update to the uh, object. Here, as you can see, I use two, two Blender scenes. One uh, is assembled from collections, so no, no unique geometry there, but I can uh, easily edit uh, separate objects and uh, I will get the updates right, away, right there. So great thing here is that I can use any modifiers, objects, and stuff like that in, the s in separate scene and uh, ignore them in main scene because I just link objects. And later, later on you can uh, return to your uh, scene and bake stuff and it will update everywhere. Uh, so in conclusion, I would like to, uh, I would like to say that uh, you should, uh, it's, it's a great thing to invest your time into uh, learning about modifiers and incorporate them into your into your daily routine because it saves a lot of time and uh, it's procedural and it's great. So thanks. Yeah. <coughs> so uh, let me brief briefly conclude it. Uh, I would like to uh, highlight what is great in Blender and what is not so great about Blender right now, and how it could improve and how we could all benefit from that. Uh, so first, not so great. Uh, as we have said before, uh, UV mapping has to seriously improve uh, to make a big statement in game development. And uh, current implementation of uh, UV mapping module is probably 10 years old. So it should change, be, or at least be overhauled. So, second one is subdivision modeling. Uh, we understand that the algorithm for uh, subdivision has been uh, improved, and now it's of uh, higher quality. We, you get higher, uh, higher quality results. But at the same time, we have lost in speed. And uh, what we have to do now is uh, we uh, switch on uh, subdiv modifier, uh, see what we have, uh, what we're working with, then we switch it off, and then we model, push polys, polygons, vertices, whatever. 
and then we switch it back on to just to see what uh, what what we have done to see the results. Uh, this is suboptimal. Uh, I think uh, this uh, should also be improved. You would like to have this same uh, this kind of quality that we have now, but with the same speed that we had before. That would be pretty awesome. All right, uh, third one, uh, undo, of course. Uh, it really holds us back, not always, but sometimes in some scenes that are very, uh, you know, complex, uh, it can hold us back. We can mitigate this issue by uh, separating the uh, asset into uh, several elements and then link them from uh, different blend files, but we would like to avoid that. But that's, that's about it for uh, the uh, shortcomings from our side. Uh, now, I have to say that Despite all of the shortcomings that we, I have uh, discussed, uh, Blender is an excellent uh, modeling tool, and uh, we, we need to highlight some of its more awesome features. So, uh, modifiers. Uh, modifiers is what makes Blender extra special. Uh, uh, Subdiv, uh, what else? Um, solidify, uh, bevel boolean, uh, it's all the uh, special sauce that uh, makes uh, Blender what it is, and I cannot imagine uh, going back to what I had before. I, I like this uh, non-destructive, very procedural uh, way of working uh, up until the uh, very end when we export the asset to a game engine. So Eevee, it has uh, given us freedom, uh, uh, missing that uh, extra step, as I have said before, of exporting the asset just to see what the hell you, you are doing. Uh, very important, very important. And speed. Uh, speed in terms of uh, uh, how uh, fast the Blender starts up, it takes seconds, while uh, industry standard software uh, can take minute or more, uh, a minute or more to start. Uh, we really like that because these minutes uh, add up during the day, especially if you load that uh, standard industry software with a lot of plugins, with a lot of uh, uh, in-house uh, build tools, and this makes uh, your uh, software unstable and then it crashes all the time. You know, you probably all know that. So Blender starts in minutes and this really saves uh, time and by saving time it saves money. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, in the end we would like to share some resources. Uh, they happen to be written by, uh, uh, made by uh, artists from our studio but that's a simple coincidence. Uh, uh, is because we are the best. I'm joking. <laughs> joking. And uh, some of our uh, contact details. Uh, you can uh, get in touch with us. Tell us how awful and uh, uh, boring the presentation was. Or on the other hand, maybe you liked it. Tell us, please. Uh, I would be very. We would be very excited uh, to hear your input. And we very much appreciate your attention. We think. Uh, we we hope that uh, you. All uh, think that it is. Uh, it, it has been somewhat useful for you. Maybe you would uh, uh, use some of the approaches that we have discussed discuss here at your work. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>